Welcome to this week's edition of the show. If you've been following this series, you'll know it's about inspirational people in the community doing great things. And this week we have none other than actor Ray Fearon, actor and old friend. How are you Come doing? Come hug me up. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. It's a pleasure. How are you? It's always a pleasure. I'm really good. I'm really well. Well, I know you're Mr. Busy, so it's hard to get you. So we're very <laughs> lucky. To, <laughs> this has taken about how long? <laughs> Nearly a year to yeah, get you here? Yeah, yeah. But I'm here. Yes, finally. You know, I did promise that I'll, uh, when I do get the time, we'll do it. And, and, and I'm here. I'll yeah, tell you guys, pleasure. I was actually thinking, oh, God, have I got to sit in front of Ray Ferran? Too good looking. I'm going to sit here with a bag over my head <laughs> and interview this guy, man. <laughs> so how have you been? I've been well. I've been busy with work, um, busy with family. Um, oh, yeah, but, you know, but, 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 but life is good. I'm grateful. That's I'm grateful. the, the I'm thing, grateful. being grateful. Yeah. Being grateful. So tell me, where did you grow up? I grew up in northwest London, a place called Harlesden. That's where I was born. Right. I was born in Park Royal Hospital, which is uh, not too far from Harlesden <laughs> <laughs> train station. And um, yeah, I lived in a place called Drayton Road for until I was about six, seven. And then we moved to Wembley, which is about a mile, two miles away. Um, it was kind of, my mum and dad kind of thought Harlesden was a, was an inner city area, and obviously they wanted to try and move to the suburbs, which was, <laughs> which about, was Wembley, which was like a mile away. But um, um, you know, I, I enjoyed it. But to be honest with you, we still went back to Harlesden <laughs> as kids. Well, I think to, I met you at Hilltop. Yeah, which is in Stonebridge. That, that's in right. Stonebridge yeah. Estate. Yeah, which is uh, which is where I did dance classes and and um, and, uh, and 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 acting workshops. From as early as then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and obviously, you know, the Stonebridge Estate is always sort of kind of known for its notoriety of crime and drugs and whatever, but, you know. But there was a lot else was going lot, on there as well. There was a lot of well. other stuff going on. Now, yeah. I know you come from a big family. How many of you are there? I come from a family of seven. Seven? Yeah. Well, my it's uh, I, I have five brothers and two sisters that's... Um, for my mum when my, my when my dad uh married my mother but before my dad got married my dad had two children which was back in the caribbean and jamaica right um so i have another brother and a sister and another brother here in in england so in all 10 10 of really. you yeah but my mother had seven yeah. And they're all as good looking as him trust me <laughs> we're all close Just, we're all kind of yeah. because we're all kind of so, yeah, I mean, there's one that look, almost looks like a twin with you. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost... funny because I didn't really, I didn't really, with my brothers, I only really sort of grew up with one because obviously they were a bit older than I was. But I, I, I really sort of grew up with my sisters. My sisters were more or less around Closer that in age, age group. group. Is it? Yeah, right. and, and, and obviously they were younger than me. And, and so when we were at school... And my brothers weren't at the same school, or obviously they'd left school or had gone on to do other things. I kind of, in a way, was there looking after my sisters, really. Okay. Uh, and they always remind me of it, which is, uh, which is good. I used to look after them. Yeah, the big brother, <laughs> that's right. I did. Yeah, I, I really, I, I did take care of them. I, I, yeah. I How was your school life? Did you enjoy school? Um, uh, to a point. I did. I loved, uh, you know what? I loved primary school. Um, I went to about three different primary schools. It took kind of ages to settle in the very last one because, no, yeah, because, you know, I was six when we moved and I got used to the one that I had started, you know, when I was living in Haas and when we went to Wembley, you know, it was a new school and I had you know. Did you I, find it disruptive? It was a bit. It was, it was um, yeah, I, I had to adjust a bit. I remember one day for no apparent reason, I saw the gate was open. We, and you know, like you, they take you to the toilets, <laughs> and you're all walking in a line. And for some, I just saw the gates and thought, wide I open, and I just thought, I'm gates. making a move. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I and I and I sort of like straps. Uh, you know, everybody was walking forward, and I just I just sort of just sauntered back till I was last in the queue, and then I took off. <laughs> <laughs> and went where? I ran home. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, yeah, and I sort of knocked the door and thought everybody was going to be pleased to see me. Like my mum, my mum was like, "What are you doing here? <laughs> I'm come on!" And 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 um, no sooner than I'd knock the door, I'd give it about twenty seconds. The police was there, right? Which was great. Obviously, you know coming I mean? to inform I was a her child that your missing. son's missing. Yeah, yeah, I was a child missing, and they just wanted to know he is was right. But it was quite some a fair distance. Where the school was and where my house was. And so you I made a break yeah, for the Yeah, I had to go over. I had, and I was six. And I had to go over like big. Main roads. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah, yeah. And I managed to do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> look and at find you, look my at way. Very proud of that I moment. Was, yeah, I found <laughs> yeah. my way. To this very day, I'm looking back and thinking, why did how, I run out? Why did I run And how did I manage it? <laughs> yeah, but I think it was. It was the adjustment. It was, I was just, I was finding it difficult to adjust and then you know and I, and I and i just yeah the thoughts of i've got to get out of here and then i did i made the move <laughs> and i don't know after that i was kind of all right i only realized that it was wrong when my mom sort of went what are you doing here you should be at school and I go, <laughs> maybe this was a good <laughs> idea good idea after and all. then the other school that i went to because i then left that school and we had to go to a school which wasn't too far from where we live which was at the end of our street which you know they call them th catchment areas basically right so so we now lived in a catchment area where we were going to the school down the road and that's when i i got to know all the guys in the area Locally. where i lived and and uh, yeah, and we were all good mates. Yeah, you know, the great thing is that these guys still come and see me in shows and things from since we were six. That's then, fantastic. Yeah, and then my mum, we were all going to go to the same school. They all, you know, their mum, you know, used to get the, the forms where you, you get the preference school and then you get the second place. And, and they all put this school as their preference. I remember it was Alberton School. And, and that's where I went because everybody was going, all my friends. And my mum decided to send me to a new half grammar, half comprehensive, which was about three miles away. Yeah. And that finished me off. Really? Yeah, I, I just, because I hated it. You know, the fact that I was kind of away from my friends. You know, I'd grown up with all these people and I just, it was, it was, it was, a, there was a comfortability that you knew that got, you know, that you would have felt at ease had you gone to school with these guys, you know, the felt of ease, you know, you would have, you would have adjusted very well into, into bigger school. And, but my mum sent me to a school where I didn't know anybody and, uh, and, it, and, uh, and in a way I, I rebelled and that's okay. when, and that's when my sort of trouble started. <laughs> it was after a year, I just, I just, I had enough of the place. I didn't like the place. I didn't like the teachers. I didn't like. I remember they had, uh, they had an end master who was used to wear a cap and gown. You know, he used to wear, he used to go around. And most of them used to wear his cap and gown, and we used to have to sit in assembly and listen to Tchaikovsky and and Rachmaninoff. I remember we used to have to sit there whilst he was kind of batting out this thing like a you know, like a conductor. And we used to just sit there thinking, what is this? I just remember thinking, where am I? <laughs> you know, and 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 you used to get into trouble for not having a tie or a or a or, or a school badge. I remember my, my you know the, the actual school shop where you buy the uniforms from where th there was a delay for ties. They didn't have any ties and they went, well we'll have the next we'll have ties in the next two months. And I remember I was in the school and the guy just he sent me home. Because I didn't have this didn't tie, have tie, which wasn't, which was no fault of mine and no fault of my mom's. But he just went, go home, you know, come back when you've got a tie, and it was, it's kind of that kind of weirdness and 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 staccato, you know. But now, sort of as an adult, pointing. do you see the experience differently, or see that your mother was possibly hoping for something different for you? Oh, absolutely. I I I I, I can. You know, in hindsight, sight is a beautiful thing, yeah. as they say. If only, you <laughs> had, if only you had it at the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and when I look back, it you know, yeah, my mum was trying to sort of send me somewhere where I could, where it was going to be much more stricter, had a bit more discipline. Obviously, she thought that the education... Was of a higher standard. Yeah, was a higher standard. It was a half grammar school. And, you know, maybe she was right. Uh, but I just didn't adjust. And it was weird because... My daughter, when we were sending my daughter, we were sending her to private school and um, 
I mean, a, a fantastic school. We took her to a comprehensive school and, and ex the exact same thing happened. She hated it. Right. And I remember thinking there was one point where I thought, God, I'm trying to give her the opportunity that I didn't have. But you had, and then it. I remember, yeah. I, and I was walking through the school, and I could see like all the the the, the 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 material things that they had. The buildings were fantastic. They had tennis courts. They had, you know, they had their own theatre and stuff like that. And then I remember walking through, and then I thought, what am I on about? I would have hated this place okay. if it was me. Right? I, okay. I would have hated it. I and, and I I immediately understood what she meant when she, you know, so she was going to the preschool. You know, and uh, but it was very regimental. It was very kind of very regimental, very very strict. They obviously the the you know the offset report was very very high, and so you know they got to keep that standard. And uh, you know, uh, but also as well, I think it comes at a cost. You know, and well, that's the thing in life, isn't it? Everything comes at a cost. Absolutely. It's just whether it's worth the cost or not. That's it. So, and I think at times where they were a bit too strict with things, where I, I just, I found, you know, because my daughter was six, and and she was kind of being taught. You know what I mean? It was like quite a bit regimented. And I mm -hmm. think at that age, I just think you need to be a bit more looser. You know what I mean? And and you need to give them a little bit more freedom to kind of find certain things of their own and she was like that at home i could see she was a very um you know she was a very open artistic child who would just create well, her mother's and play artistic and as well isn't she her mom did the exact same thing that i did but you know when we had a great nanny too which is you know she was so she was very open and she was very open with, but but somehow when she was going to school it it, it, it kind of it, yeah it kind of started to close her off and she you know she actually she, she after a a while she just she didn't want to go right you know and i was like you know why did she want to go what's the problem and i thought it was a problem with her and actually it was a problem with the school and you know in the end we just put her back into the school where she was at because we oh, really yeah and we thought you know what i mean at first you kind of think oh my gosh we're going to put her back in a comprehensive school is she going to succeed because she was a bright girl no it was perfectly fine she went to that she went to a comprehensive school she did as well as she would have done. She came out with like 10 A's in her GCSEs. It made no difference if you're well, right. Well, there, there right. is the train of thought that says, well, you know, if a child really wants to learn, they will learn regardless which the environment they're in. Absolutely. Um, but then there's also the train of thought that, well, you know what, if you're in a uh, what's considered a better environment or more controlled and disciplined environment, it can bring something out in you. So I guess it's 50-50. Absolutely. Absolutely. But for me, I mean, you know, the school, as I said, I rebelled and I didn't, I stopped, I stopped going after a while and I started to get in a trouble and, you know, the things that teenagers do. And the, But luckily for me, you know, I don't know what happened, but, you know, I just, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I saw quite a lot of, experience with with friends going a completely wrong way and i just uh, you know i changed i was gonna say so what yeah. was the turning point for you because you said at one stage in school you were going off the rails yeah i went off what, the rails <laughs> what um what the was rails. the turning point for you that brought you back on the straight and narrow because well, i look at you and for as long as i've known you you've yeah. never been somebody that i would ever say was off the rails even when i knew you 30 years ago yeah well i've, I've, I've well it's I've more kind than of, 30 years isn't yeah it? <laughs> absolutely well I, I i i it was what happened was at one point i i um i got i got sent to a young offenders um institution and i think whilst i was there you know uh, I, I used to, at the time, I used to think it was the worst thing that they could have ever done, blah, blah, blah. And actually, when I look back, I thought, you know something? It most probably was the best thing that had ever happened to me because whilst I was there, it gave me time to think. Actually, I don't belong here. <laughs> yeah, but also as well, it was because it was it was kind of army regimental, regimented. And, you know, I, I, I remember that, you know, the officers were prison officers and stuff. It was just like young people being in prison. And... Um, but I remember sort of sitting there thinking, do you know what? My life could go either two ways. I can continue this and my life will go somewhere to nowhere very, very quickly, mm. or I could change. And I remember it was when I was actually leaving this place, um, when I was leaving this place and I was going through the gates 
And by this time now, I, you know, cause I was there for like six, seven weeks, you know, it's like they, it's for three months, but they give you a half the time, uh, you know, and if you stay on good behavior, so you come out in half your time, but you can lose that time once, whilst you're there. And, um, and so I think I lost a few days or something like that. But anyway, whilst I was going through, obviously I was, a, I was bigger. So my clothes, <laughs> when I put my clothes back on, <laughs> the clothes were short because, you know, I hadn't been in, uh, you know, the same yeah, clothes yeah. were waiting for me in reception and stuff. I was doing circuits in there? in there. I was in there for about six, seven weeks. Okay. But I was doing circuits in there. I, I, you know, I, I joined a gymnastics team. They let us out to go and do gymnastics and things. And, um, and I, and I kind of did pretty well, but, but, but whilst I was there, as I said, I just thought my life is going to get better, but how, what am I going to do? And it was when I was leaving, then this officer said to me, he said to me, you'll be back. That's what he said in my ear when I was leaving. He said, he said, good luck, uh, Fearon, but you know, I'm afraid you'll be back. And I went, no, I won't. And he went, we'll see. And I just remember that thing, I was on the train going back and that thing was ringing in my ears. And I just thought, it's got to get better than this. And, and, and somehow I think I'm going to have to change. How I was, was going to do it, I had no idea. But I just remember I so went- So what age was this? I was like 14. Wow. Yeah. And um, I remember I went back to school and nobody at school would actually, you know, I was waiting for teachers and stuff to sort of come to me and say, um, and say, you know, Ray, I mean, how are you feeling? How was it? No one said a word. No one said nothing. And I remember I was at a loss. I just thought nobody cares. It was, you know, and it was at that, I was at a vulnerable time where I was actually wanting somebody teachers or somebody to say look to man, show some you, empathy something to just say yeah. look man how, how, how are you feeling how, you know you know because i just thought you know it was a time of sus laws as well you know back then where you can get picked up by police you know i mean yeah i mean so basically youth was being terrorized by, by by police quite a lot you know um and you know you could find yourself in situations where yeah you, you don't even to, know how you got there yeah and you didn't have to commit any crime you know, but you're there. And, um, and I suppose it was then that, you know, I decided, you know, a couple of years had gone by and, and I just, I was just drifting. And then I decided one day, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try and get a job. I had no qualifications at school, nothing. So I just, I just left school. I just, when, when, when I didn't get any of that feedback, I just thought that was it. I'm not going back. And I didn't go back. So you and, left uh, at 14. Yeah, I just drifted. Wow. I just drifted, and um, just hung about with friends, and you know. Um, but I then try. I got this youth opportunity scheme job where they pay you about twenty five quid a week, and and it was a it was a maintenance thing. I just I went out to try and get a job, and I couldn't get no job. Obviously, I did have no qualification, but also as well, I wasn't old enough. I was fifteen. Well, that's what I was going to say. Trying, yes. to get, <laughs> trying to get something, and um, and then I. I, I got on one of those those youth schemes and uh, I was doing a maintenance job for Godfrey Davis or something. And um, and so I'd be painting the toilets and, you know, they'd send you out to cut hedges in one of the, you know, in, in one of the branches that they had in like North Wembley or some something, they cut cutting hedges. And, and, uh, and I just remember I was cleaning these toilets and a guy came in and he was in a suit and stuff, and he kind of went, yeah, someone has to do it. I just remember sitting there thinking, now another thought, this can go two ways. <laughs> I can put this thing down, and I can get out of here, and just think, you know what, I'm gonna drift. Yeah. <laughs> or I can stick around here. Until something better comes. Like until, always. and in that moment, I just remember, I just went, I haven't got an education. I think I need to go back to school. And I and that day when that happened, I went and I joined up for a course in a college not too far from the school where I was. Mind you, this job that I got was literally across the road from the school where I was at. Right. And I went and I signed on, uh, 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 enrolled at this college, just a little college, just to do a a a a, a, a B Tech course of some sort. And um, I went there. I attended there. So I finished a job. I went there. I mucked about for a bit failed came back the following year 
on a year to do the course higher. <laughs> and they went, do you know what? You failed the last one. So what makes you think you can? And I just said to them, look, but this time I was serious. I went, could you just give me a chance? And there was a guy on that course, and I'll never forget it. And he was one of the ones I would think that changed my whole entire life. And his name was Mr. Leeds. And he knew me from the last course. And he just said to me, I remember him saying to me, the teachers don't want you back on this course. But he said, Ray, I'm going to try my damn sight best to try and get you on this course. And if they do, you're going to have to try your best. And I just said to him, listen, if they do, I swear to God, I won't let you down. And they said to me, I remember it was a Trinidadian guy who was ahead of the course. There was another chap who was Guyanese. And, and there was this guy, Mr. Lee. So it was two black guys and a white guy. Mr. Lee was a white guy and he was the English teacher. And they sat me down and they went, listen, Ray, we're going to give you till Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to give you three months. <laughs> and I said, um, and I went, all right, um, just give me the three months. And they gave me three months. And I remember the teachers were just saying, listen, all you got to do is just sit with me. I'll tell you everything. Don't." Worry. And that's all I did. I just applied myself. And from that day on, I applied myself to studies. I, I passed that thing with distinctions. I remember I came out with flying colors. I went and did a, a BTEC national course. I was doing evening classes. I went after that and did a degree. I, you know, and for the whole time, that thing changed. But that guy, that Mr. Leeds man, was still a part of my life because he was the first person that actually, when he knew I was interested in acting, when I started to do workshops and things, he started to take me to the theater. Okay. So he was the first guy to take me to the National Theatre and he'd pay for the tickets because obviously I couldn't afford him. And so I remember him taking me to see things like Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Uh, he took me to the West End to see like Michael Gambon on stuff in, 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 in uh, Uncle Vanya. You know, with um, Imelda Staunton and, and Michael Gambon and Jonathan Price. And, um, and, and, and when I started, when I got into drama school, he gave me like... Because I had a book, I had I had a series of books that I had to buy and get, you know, for my reading. Yeah. Um, and he gave me a load of plays. I remember him giving me Hamlet. He gave me like a pile of books. Said you're going to these again, and he gave me fifty pounds. He gave me a check for fifty quid, and he said, you can use that to uh, to buy some other books as well, you know. And I was like, why are you doing this? And he just said, Ray. Right. I remember asking him, say, saying, why do you do this? And he just said, there's something about you that you've got something. I can't put my finger on it, but you've got it, whatever it is. And I remember him saying that. And I just remember thinking, you didn't even know what it was. You no. had. <laughs> yeah, so. Do you know what I mean? But obviously he saw something, something in me. Something in you. Yeah. And well, as they say, you know, it's the three things for me there that you've described are integral part of you succeeding and being yeah. where you are now as i said you can throw bricks at people yeah you can either allow them to knock you over yeah or you can use them as a platform to stand on above the people that throw them absolutely you'll be back yeah and somebody has to do it those are the first two things yeah, yeah. and then obviously the guy helping you so exactly. those three things went really yeah. in your favor to change the way you saw life. Absolutely. And maybe, as I said, that officer, he was just doing or saying stuff that most probably would have happened. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because had I continued my life, I would have been back. So he wasn't, I'm not but saying that he was wrong. saying that, it it's, actually made you more determined not to let it happen. Absolutely. It was, it was that really. So as I said, even looking back at the time, uh, you know, you know, at the time when it had happened, I thought, God, this was the worst thing that could happen to me. And in hindsight, I looked and I thought, actually, it changed my life because I never got in trouble again after that. Yeah. That was it. You know what I mean? My life in that world just kind of all of a sudden, and it was, and all it really was, it was just trying to come out of your environment. It was just feeling confident outside of your Comfort zone. zone. Yeah. And, and, and that's what I started to do. I started to do the course, which was outside of where I lived. I started to get to know some other people. I then started to, you know, I became a tennis player. You know, I, I, mean, I, I was going to get to that because yeah, I remember because, you being heavily involved in tennis. Yeah. And, yeah. Long and, tennis. And that was as well, you know, the tennis was the sports side of things 
which I, you know, I, I loved tennis and, and, and I joined a tennis club and I started to play and then I started to take it seriously. And then I started to play for the clubs and then I started to play for counties. And then I found myself going abroad. So at the same, you know, uh, playing for the country, you know, a couple of times, you know, I represented Britain and um, in some ITF tournaments. But even that, you know, the thing about the sports side of stuff taught me the discipline that I had to show up for things. I had to be there on time. I had to train if I wanted to be good. And it was all sort of, it was all, it was all, it was all to do with the effort that I put in, not that somebody was doing for me. On your behalf. Exactly. It was Ray, if you show up here and we do a one hour's training every morning, you're going to become a better better tennis player. So I just thought if I put that time in, then I would. But it was great because all of it all tied in for later on because I then had the discipline to just to stick at something. But ultimately, that's you know, what everything is, improve. isn't it? It's about what you're going to actually put in, not what your mother's going to put in or your friend or your, your dad or your brother or Absolutely. someone who cares. Absolutely. Ultimately, they can only help you to a point. Absolutely. You have to then take the reins and say, well, I've got to do the rest, Absolutely. which will be 85 or 90 percent of it. You know, what Absolutely. I mean? And then it taught me as well, because whilst I was studying, it taught me to show up and do the work for that too. So it was really about what I was putting into it. And there it was were all basically, lessons. if I put there in a, a lot, yeah, yeah. I, I, then I would get a lot out. If I didn't, then I wouldn't. Even that course that I failed, I'm glad I failed it because at the time I didn't put nothing in. And I showed, mate, if you don't put anything, you're going to fail. And I knew I could have passed that course. Right. But I didn't do anything. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I did a bit of work here, a bit of work there, and I messed about, and you know, and and you know, and then I just I realized, well, this is the outcome. <laughs> yeah, is that you won't get anything, Ray, and 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 so I started to apply that to sort of most to things most in life. of my life. Yeah. yeah, and 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 really, that's and then you know, when I was at drama school, I read something that Stanislavski had had, had written that he said, "Talent without work isn't any talent at all." And then that's when I knew that the hard work really is, you know, is that's the focal point of everything. Is and you see, that's uh, that's more often than not a lot of people's attitudes with stuff. They'll see you in the position you're in now. Yeah. And they think that you just woke up one morning and decided, you know what, I want to be an actor. And it just yeah. happened. Yeah. They didn't see the groundwork that yeah. went before yeah. that for you to get where you are now, the work that you had to put in. Absolutely. And, and and even in, you know, at the time when I was, you know, doing it and I was at drama school, you know, I did very well at drama school. I loved it. And, and where did you, you go know, to drama I school? I went to Rose Bruford College, okay. you know, and um, and I had a great time. I had a, I had a, I had a fantastic time. Never, I never missed a class. I was never late for a class in three years. And, um, and it kind of helps if you like what you're doing as well. Oh, I mean, the thing about you know, it was you... that I was doing what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, I was, you know, because I was in the profession before, you know, I had an agent and stuff. And then, uh, you know, and I was just advised to, you know, I just, I didn't feel I knew enough about what I wanted to At do. At which what... point then did you actually then realize, because you said you were playing tennis and you'd done dance and, and stuff. Yeah. When did you actually realize yourself that you thought, you know, I want to take this seriously as an actor. I was doing, we were doing workshops in, you know, on the Stonehenge estate. And, um, you know, I, I always did drama workshops, like, you know, the one day here, Tricycle Theatre. You know, I joined, like, the the, 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 the youth theatre, the Tricycle, the Royal Court Youth Theatre and stuff. And so I was kind of doing it as a, a, as, as a hobby. And also it could be something that I... I wanted to go into it. And, um, you know, when we started to do plays, I, I then realized that, you know, we, we, we had a theatre company and um, we formed a theatre company and we used to take plays around to the boroughs, you know, around to all the inner city boroughs, you know, like Brixton, Lambeth, you know, um, God, where were we? Uh, I think we were over in Lewisham. At some points, you know, all around the Albany you know, in Deptford. Yeah, we were. Yeah, uh, we were. Yeah, um, theatre techniques. We were in Camden. We were all around Brent, where I where I lived, Harlston, and we were taking theatre to inner city places that might and, not and, otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And people would come, and we'd pack them out, and the borough councils. 
basically the council leisure services will give us money. And so basically what we did was we hired a director and we got some plays and it was like, right, we're doing this play and we cast them and we, we would hire a, a, a director and a stage manager and we'd hire all the lighting stuff and we put them up in youth theater, in, 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 in youth theaters and, and places like that, Larry Constantine and all that, wow. and set up the sets and everything else ourselves, put on the shows, do the show, end of the evening, pack it all down. You know, uh, when the show was finished, we took back the lights, which we hired from the lighting company, company down yeah. in <laughs> Park Royal. Yeah, we had a we had a we had a kind of touring company. company. That was, yeah, and it was then really that I kind of realized that I thought, you know what, I really want to do this. I want to do this and take it to the next level. Yeah. Also, as well, it was a place where I kind of had a voice. I found that the stage was a form of freedom where I could say stuff <laughs> and be characters. <laughs> And no one could stop me. <laughs> I thought, this is great freedom. I can stand up here and say stuff and people will listen <laughs> if yeah. they care to. But, um, and so that, you know, I remember that. But that's that, one of the things of being an actor. You can be who you want exactly. to be. And that, and that, and that really enthused You don't always have well. to be Ray Fairon. You're, Ex- you're never Ray Fairon when exactly. you go on there. Exactly. And, and. And also, so people was telling me that I was damn good at it. So, um, you know, I, I just, I wanted to get better. And then when it came to things like, you know, you know, because I just knew, uh, you know, I started, somebody gave me a reading list. It was somebody gave me a reading list and it was about Greek, you know, Greek writers. It was from the Greeks, the Romans, and they gave me this reading list. So I was reading all the, you know, Aristophanes and, and Sophocles and, you know, all the Greek writers, then all the Roman writers, you know, right, you know, right up through Ibsen, you know, to the present day and Shakespeare. And I just thought, I don't know enough about this. And, um, and that's when I realized that, um, I need to go and train. Um, and, uh, if I, if, if I went and trained, then I would know a lot more. And I loved Shakespeare. I just didn't know anything about it. I was at the city lit by then you know um and the great thing was you know at the time when i was doing it you know we still had the glc so yeah. i had you know so i was doing a lot of these courses and things and it was financed i mean yeah you know unfortunately now youngsters really don't have that kind of stuff at their disposal and it's unfortunate that happens because you know as i said I, that was at my disposal i used it you know I, and I, it's I, evident as you say the youngsters now don't have those things at their disposal yeah and it's evident in their behavior in what's happening with children because they're just not occupied in that way and finance absolutely. for it to be occupied absolutely absolutely and, it, yeah. and it's and it's you know it's 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 not their fault you know it's just the fact that governments and things so unless just... your parents can afford to send you to uh or send you to this group that club this it you know you're just left at a loose end you that's, know your parents are working that's and... that's it that's it so if you were left at a loose end at the time when i was growing up they were places find and things something that you, you could to do. go yeah. do you know what yeah let me just try and see if i can do something here absolutely and see what happens and so you know you know, lucky for me, thank God, and I'm grateful for it, that those things were available. And so I was at the City Lit, you know, part-time for two years and stuff. And then, yeah, I decided that, you know, I was going to audition for drama school and I auditioned and then decided that, yeah, I was going to go. Um, I, basically, I was I was doing a play for Joint Stock. Um, it was called Serious Money and Alfred Molina and remember uh, Gary Ullman and stuff was in the play and, and we had to go to... Um, like the metal exchange and places to uh to 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 devise the piece and then we'll come back to the theater and then carol churchill will will um will basically start writing and uh i just remember just the language that these guys had and i just you know so i used to watch like i mean you know mira sayal i remember her being a young actress at the time too then but i just remember watching people like you know, I was watching her and, you know, uh, Leslie Manville and they were just, I mean, they were phenomenal. And I just remember thinking, I want to do what they're doing. <laughs> I want to I I do, do it. it. You know, and I just remember Gary Ullman, Gary talking to me and saying, I'm going, I want to do what they're doing. And Gary had gone to the college that I'd gone to and that, and that was the reason why I went. 
<laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and um, and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go there. You know, and he was at the time the kind of the young actor that was going to be the big star. He was sort of he was going off to Hollywood at the time, and I, and and but he definitely proved them right. Oh, absolutely. The big star. And I just I mean, thought, you know, what a genius was, actor. Yeah, he's actor genius. was brilliant, and and then I decided to go, and then he came. He didn't know I went, and. He came back, he came to the college to, to do a talk when I was in my mid second year. He, there was a, there was a tutor who died now, God rest her soul, Sally Grace, who used to, um, she used to teach voice and movement and she was very close with him and she brought him back for a chat and I didn't tell any of your students that I knew him. Right. And we were sitting and I think he just, can't remember what movie he was doing at the time when he came back and he came up with somebody, came with somebody and was talking, talking, talking. And then he looked and, I, I he was looking him. at me and he and then sort of midway through he went is that Ray <laughs> and I went yeah and he went good on you mate you kept him but I just remember all the students Going. turned around like <laughs> where does he know Gary Owen from <laughs> and um and and it was you know I just remember saying to him it was because of him why why, why I went you know and um He's a cool dude, man. I mean, I haven't seen him for years, whether he'd remember, you know, yes, I'm sure he would. But, I you mean, know, he has to be amongst champion. my tops yeah. where actors are concerned. Yeah. I mean, he metamorphosizes Absolutely. with every character. Um, but he was a big phenomenal. influence at the, at, at the time. I remember watching him and then I just remember thinking, I don't know enough about this and I really want to know it and I want to learn all of Shakespeare. And, and that was it, really. So really, it was when I went to drama school, that's when I really kind of started to, you know, work on the stuff that I wasn't good at. I, you know, drama school gave me the opportunity to fail without being <laughs> judged or anything Oh, ridiculed. Like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was just a place for learning. So I just, I, I learned it, I took it and, you know, and from but there But I guess on, it's really, like I, anything, you have to learn your trade regardless what it is. Yeah. yeah to no, be no, good no, at absolutely. it, you have I, to I, learn you know, your I, trade. I would, you know, these days a lot of times, you know, people aren't going to drama school or they you know, they have an easy access into film or whatever it is. But I would always try and tell young actors to... Go and study. To go and study because, you know, it's 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 a lot of the time, it's not about getting into the profession and, you know, I want to be... You know, it's, it's about understanding yourself. I understood a lot about myself, you know, my relation to what I was doing, my relation to the industry. And also knowing that when you get into it, you actually know what you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. And you're not haphazard running it by... Exactly, you know, because whilst I was there, yeah, whilst I was there, I remember, you know, I, I, you know, uh, the head of acting saying to me one day, he saw me doing some Shakespeare. We 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 were doing a Shakespeare, and he said to me, you know, he said you've got great talent at this. You know, you speak the verse like it's you've 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 been doing this for. And I was like, really? He said, yeah, you have a natural talent for it. And then he said to me, but I'm afraid that you might you most probably won't get the work when you leave doing it and I thought why and he said well because you know the way it is out there is the fact that they most people think that black people or black actors can't do the verse very well or you know I mean those those parts won't be open to you and that was it the minute he said that I went then why am I learning it if it's not going to be open for me to do it and I've read because I was reading all the stuff about Gilgood you know, you know, saying if you can do Shakespeare, you can do anything, and also, you know, all, all the actors that I really admired, you know, the, you know, the, the Judy Denches and and you know the the, the the Olivier's, everybody that you know, the, you know, what I mean, um, had gone through Shakespeare, yeah. exactly, you know, exactly, Richard Burton, everybody who had yeah. gone through the RSC and stuff had done Shakespeare, and then I thought, what, this is not going to be at my disposal. I'm not going to get the opportunity to. And it wasn't to get the opportunity, it was to get the opportunity to improve. Because mm -hmm. once you're doing that kind of stuff, it's the improvement. Mm -hmm. You need the crack to improve. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to get that opportunity to improve and become better. And I thought, well, I'm sorry, but um, I'm still going for it. So my aim was... Brick number three. Yeah. That's I was brick gonna, number three yeah, thrown at you. I was going to go to the RSC and I was going to become a leading actor. And I remember when I first got to the RSC... And I was the only um, actor that w had w had speaking parts, black actor that had speaking parts. There was three of us. The other two actors were doing players cast. I mean, great actors as well. 
Um, not that they should have been, you know, and, and there were no black actresses of a hundred out of a hundred actors. Wow. And that's, and I said, and I remember being there thinking, do you know what I mean? All the greats had been there and everybody was there, you know, at the time when I was there then, you know, and it was a place where I always, because it was a place of excellence. So Simon Russell Beale was there at the time, the, you know, Sam Mendes, you know, all the great actors had been through there, Helen Mirren, every, and I just thought, no, this is the place of excellence and, and, and this is where I want to be. The great John Barton was still there teaching people. And then I was getting taught by these people. And then I remember John Barton coming to me one day and he said, you know what? You're going to be one of the leading actors out there on that stage. You know, and, really? Because he used to do these master classes and you had to do sort of stuff in front of everybody. He said, I, I do believe that you will be one of those actors. And, uh, and I did become one of those actors, which is now I'm a associate artist at the RSC and I did become a leading actor. And I wasn't, and that was my aim. My aim was to change the politics in there towards black actors. And, and the great and way you've happened. done it is to be involved in it to make the change. Yeah. Rather than be outside of it, complaining about it not being what you would well, like it to be. Well, that's what was my thing was. My thing was actually to be as good as anybody and to be in there. Uh, Which is what makes the change. Yeah, and yeah. get the opportunity and do something with the opportunity. And um, And so, you know, there was a lot of us young actors who were there, you know, David Tennant and, you know, uh, um, Joseph Fiennes and, you know, loads of, you know, the actors who, you know, Victoria Hamilton and, you know, great actors who, you know, young actors, we were all young and we all came out and we all did very, very well. But, you know, it was just great to be amongst that, you know, and I just knew that, you know, I was improving. So by the time I was playing Othello, people like David A. Yellowwell and everybody else started to come you know, there as young actors that they started to see a leading player on that stage doing stuff that they were like, yes, I, I can do that too. And it was that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, um, and I'm glad that, you know, not that they weren't, and, you know, because there were people like Hugh Quashie and stuff, you know, not that there wasn't people that so came before me. So what you're describing here is all the training that you had. This is the training, is it? Yeah, it's a lot to do with the training right. and, 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 and getting the opportunity and making use of the opportunity. What was your first big job, major job, and what was the feeling? Major job? Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I kind of saw them all as kind of major. I started off doing rep because rep was still, so rep theatre was still around. So, you know, I, 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 and it was a Shakespeare. I ended up doing mainly Shakespeare. Right. So I came out, I was doing The Tempest, which went on a tour to Japan. And, you know, I was playing Ferdinand in The Tempest. And then I went up north. Okay. You know, to, to the Liverpool Everyman, where I played Othello. I was only like 22, 23. You know, I was in, um, uh, you know, another uh, a restoration comedy. Left there, went to the Manchester Royal Exchange, was in Love's Labour's Lost, which is another Shakespeare. You yeah. know, then went over to the Contact Theatre. And then I went to the RSC. Um, uh, and I did my first season there. I was two years there, uh, and then the following, I think I think I took a season out, or the following. Season. I was there. I was the R I was at the RSC then for about nine nine years, nearly ten years right. straight. Okay. And um, and I, you know, uh, um, I would say my first big lead, at, uh, you know, or title role at the RSC was Romeo. Uh, and and. Um, you know, but before that, I, yeah, I was in a play called The White Devil, where I played one of the one of the, one of the leads in The White Devil. But I think from that, then Michael Attenborough, you know, offered me uh, Romeo, and and really from there, you know, which was a world tour, playing Romeo, and, and I would say, yeah, it was. Um, but I'd always been, you know, but in a main in a in a major company, that was my first kind of big type of role in right. in, a, in a play. In, in a prominent place. And and really from there, I just, because straight after I'd finished playing Romeo, I then played Othello and then, you know, Pericles and, you know, and uh, yeah. Because and, and, I've been following what you've been doing. Yeah. I've been seeing. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, they went to the National, you know, Dunbar, you know, so, you know, I've worked in all the, all, all the places, you know, we were, you know, then the RSC was based at the Barbican too, so, all the plays would leave Lund leave Stratford, go to the Barbican. Barbican. You'd play at the Barbican for a year or so. 
So, um, you know, and then kind of TV, you know, I kind of went into that. My first television was, was, um, was Prime Suspect. You know, great One part. of my favorites. Love Prime so, Suspect. So, and Helen Mirren. So yeah. I was opposite Helen Mirren for, you know, I was terrified. <laughs> but, but to have her there was just, you know, we used to talk about. You were playing a policeman. No, no, I was playing. I was playing a. I was playing a writer. A writer. Where I okay. wrote a book that threw off the force uh, for miscarriages of justice. Oh, okay. Um, uh, which, which was great. Um, it was a great part, actually. And I had some great scenes with her. And that was my first TV. And then my first film was Hamlet with Kenneth Branagh. You know, and 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 you and see, I, this guy doesn't go in lightly. When he goes in, he goes in. Well, I didn't know. I, I, you know, I, <laughs> he I, goes I, did, in. I didn't know at the time. But you know what I mean? Yeah. And then and you know, and then I worked for Brenner after that before. But it was just, I mean, I couldn't have asked for a, a, a better start in those things as well. Absolutely. And to, and to watch greats at work when you you know, Kenneth Brenner is and be like a sponge while you're watching them. Oh, too. absolutely. You know? It was like you know, you know, when, um, Kenneth Brenner is just. You know, when you see, you know, I just think he's a dedicated master at work. And um, and my scene, and my first scene was, which was amazing, was with the great Jack Lemon. Really? Jack Lemon. And I, and I remember when we got to the set and, you know, <laughs> I was, got up to the set and, 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 and Ken said, uh, it was freezing. It was winter and we were up by Blenheim Palace and he, and he, and he said, um, I didn't even hear him. He said, bring up Ray's chair. You know, so he started to talk to me about the scene. It's what we're going to do. Blah, blah, blah. So we're at the... And I was going, yeah, 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 I'm listening to that. And then all of a sudden, I saw them bring a chair. And the chair had my name on it. They made you your own chairs. So it had all kind of, you know, it was done in some fancy Italic writing. writing. I saw yeah. Ray fear on. And then he put the chair in between the chair. So Jack Lemon was here. Kenneth Branagh was there, and my chair was in the middle. <laughs> and I froze. And he was talking. And you're not and I, it. And I wasn't paying no attention. I was just going, I can't believe that that's the My chair, chair in between Jack Lemon and, and he, Kenneth yeah, And he turned around and he said, are, he you, went, are you listening? He went, did you just say what I said? I went, this is my chair. <laughs> <laughs> and he said... Well, yeah, I told him to bring it for you. <laughs> but I went, but you don't understand. <laughs> that was my chair That's in my between. my chair <laughs> in between. Lemon and, yeah. and Branner. It was just, it was just, it was amazing. I kept the chair. Really? Yeah, I took it. <laughs> I'm sure you would. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so great. I had, a, yeah, it was, it was a small part, but it was, it was great. And I, you know, I remember sort of going in and I, I said to him, do you want me to read or anything? Because he, when I was first at the RSC, Branagh was playing Hamlet at the RSC. So, you know, it was just great to watch greats as well. And that was one of my things was to always watch the experienced actors at work and see how good they were and, you know, see what I can take, what yeah. I can nick, um, see the way they did things, how disciplined they were. And it was, you know, and, you know, it was just great. Same and you realize that. Being where they are, doing what they do at the level that they do it is no easy feat. They've had to go through, and they still do. The, yeah, they, 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 they still do. You don't realize also as well when Branagh was that when Ken was doing that film, he was also he was also um, editing Much Ado About Nothing. And he was casting Frankenstein. <laughs> and then when we, you know, later on, we were, we were doing Macbeth, you know, we were, play, we were doing Macbeth in the theatre. And, um, and he's still got the same, he's dedicated to everything, was never late for nothing. At the same time, he was, he had to go back into reshoots of Jack, the Jack Ryan film that he was doing. And he was also prepping for uh, Cinderella. And he was playing Ham uh, Macbeth, yeah. and he was co-directing it with Rob Ashford. Now that's a schedule. <laughs> that is and a he schedule. Was, and, and I was playing Macduff in it, and so we had to, you know, we had to have fight calls and stuff. And do, and he was never late. He was ne ne never. And he just he loves what he does, and um, and he loves actors, and you know, you, it's not a. 
you know, it's 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 not a um, a dictatorial a, a, a dictatorial, dictatorial, dictatorial yeah. you know rehearsal room or anything like that. It's a very lovely space to work. You know, as long as you're getting on with it. Um, you know, well, as long as you go and do what you're there to do, they should know not a problem. Well, absolutely, <laughs> and that's and that's and that's what he asks of you, basically. And uh, and it's 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 great, and it's just. But those are just a few of the opportunities that I've had, which I'm very grateful for, and you know that I've been that I've been given and and, and I've taken advantage of really. So what are you doing now? <laughs> what <I've been> doing <laughs> now? <laughs> well, I've just finished. I was doing a. I was doing a. Um, a, 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 a uh, a version of Guys and Dolls, which was a, uh, which was an all black cast, but it wasn't because it was an all black cast. It's set in Harlem. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, but it's set in Harlem. Harlem. It's Guys and Dolls, yeah. Yeah, but it was great. It was great, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd never done a, a, you know, I've sung in stuff before, but I'd never done a, a whole musical. So I was playing Nathan Detroit in that, which was, which was great, and it was fantastic. Got received very well. It was, you know, I, I don't know whether it might be coming to town at some point because it was at Manchester Royal Exchange. You know, um, I had a film out, which could be still out. I'm sure it's on Netflix now, um, um, which is uh, called A Foreigner uh, with uh, Jackie Chan <laughs> and Pierce Brosnan. Right. And uh, I play a copper in that one. <laughs> but like the head of of terrorism, uh, like SO15. Because I know I've seen a, a promo picture of you in a... White shirt with a lapel. I think it's that film. Um, it's that police film. badge. It's that film. Yeah, it's that film. It's a great part. It's the third lead, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's a great part. It's a good film. Um, it's a it's a great film, um, and it, it did very very well. But I think it's on Netflix now. I was so after that after I'd finished the theatre, I'd then gone to South Africa to do a thing called Origin, which was a series which is coming out on YouTube Red. Which is another one of these streaming series, which, yeah. which is YouTube's um, platform now. Which you know, YouTube is owned by Google, so you know, loaded there. And those, you know, the ones that I did was uh, was directed by Paul Anderson. Um, finished doing that. What else? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You're so coming I, up I, with a Kenneth Branagh schedule here. You? No, no. Okay. <laughs> but, like, you know, but, the, but also as well, you 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 kind of have a, a a lot of things coming out as well. I've got you know, there's a a film that I did called The Yellow Birds, you know, which was Jennifer Aniston and Tony Collette, which was shown at Sundance last year. I mean, there's a cameo role that I had in that. So that's just being. Um, um, it, that's just uh, being just come out now. It's coming out uh, middle of this this month, so that's been released. Um, uh, there's another one that which is shown in Cannes, which I just saw the new trailer for, which I did uh, called um, Origins Unknown, which was another sci-fi thing. Um, yeah, and that's 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 really it. Theatre, I kind of normally sort of put a little bit on the back burner because. Um, because I do quite a lot of it. I don't do as much as I used to do. Um, so I'm having a bit of break from that. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'm doing a lot of recordings as well. I just, I just, I just finished presenting the jazz festival, which was, I did it last year, the Cheltenham jazz festival okay. for radio two, which is live, which is, it's great. It's terrifying. Cause it goes out live for an hour and you're doing it in front of about 2000 people with a, like a hundred piece orchestra behind you. And then there's singers like Tony Momrell and um, Vanessa Haynes. And I mean, I mean, fantastic, fantastic singers. And this, this year's theme was um, Tony Cherry, who's the, who's the producer. Um, he has themes where last year I did it, it was the birth of soul. So, you know, you, you, you sort of did all the stuff, you know, uh, um, you know, all you know, all, all the soul greats, um, and this year was riverboat jazz. So it's basically uh, how riverboat jazz came about from Mississippi, right way through. Oh, okay. Who was influenced yeah, on yeah. riverboat jazz? You know, to from Louis Armstrong to Clark Terry to do you know what I mean? You know, to whoever. And um, and 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 basically, it's a program that you. So it's the history of it. So I've got to read all of that live. In front of two thousand people, <laughs> which goes out on Radio Two live, live. 
and 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 basically the I'm the only one who's doing the, the reading. The terrifying word is live, isn't it? Live. Live. Yeah, yes, when anything is live, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because you did not make a mistake. <laughs> but the thing is to relax and just go, you know, whatever happens, happens. But no, it always goes well, and it did go well. I, I you know, I can only. I'm ask. looking forward to doing it again this year. Yeah, I've done it. You've I did it. it. I did okay. it on Friday, so it it should be on uh, BBC iPlayer now. Right. So I did that, and I've got some other sort of stuff to do Terry Pratchett things and you know so life's good it's it's all good and um I'm 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 grateful you're looking well on it you're looking very well on it thank you it's good to see you yeah it's a pleasure but the common thread that I always ask my guests is with these busy schedules that you have what do you do to look after Ray himself what do you do what is your thing to look after you and keep you in a nice mellow, calm place and on an even keel to deal with all of this. What do you do? <laughs> My girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> down. My girlfriend is a very calm person. So she, she, don't, she normally kind of, she calms her. My daughter. My daughter's a fantastic How old is she now? Person. My daughter's 20 now. What? Yeah. She's, wow. um, she's, uh, she didn't want to go to university and I think now she's going. Fingers crossed, <laughs> but she's doing very well. She's a she's a great kid. I really I really adore her. I do a lot of I do yoga, Bikram yoga, um, and um, I I run a lot. I've always I've always kept myself fit and well, but I always run a lot. And you know I I, I try to do a bit of a bit of meditation. Brenner got me into you know I because he meditates he meditates yeah. quite a lot and um, gave me a, a book. Uh, and a CD about you know meditation. So I started to get into meditation. So I meditate a bit too, um, and I try and see the people who I don't see for quite a while. As long as I pop in and see people like my mum and stuff, who just kind of keeps me on a, a, an even keel. Where I just go right, it just everything just all right sizes me. <laughs> the minute I'm out of kilter somewhere, right, I just get it right, brings it right down to yeah, level. I just yeah, get right level. sized, and I just go, oh right, okay, uh, I know where I'm at. And, uh, and it's great, you know. I mean, you don't. I mean, it's not. I don't get sort of, you know, too big for my boots or think. You know, well, they don't allow you to. No, they absolutely don't allow not. you to. You know, absolutely not. And it's a good thing. I've, you know, because life is life, and 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 um, you know, and and you know, you're you're a part of it, and 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 also as well, I see how much, you know, looking back, I see much of how much of a role that they and my family, you know, like my mom and dad, because they are my role models, that the match of a, of a role that they've played in my life too. And, and, and so I even become more grateful for them and what they've done and, and, and the, the, you know, the, the kind of hardships that they've been through that I don't have to go through that. And, mm. you know, my thing was, I didn't want to let them down. I didn't, you know, going back to that kid when, I was kind of, I could have drifted into anything. And I just, they were one of the reasons why I just thought they worked so hard and they've, they've left another country, you know, the, you know, they were in rush generation yes. and, 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 and they, um, they worked so hard and tried their utmost best to do the best that they could. And I just thought, raise a family and have a foundation for that yeah. family in a place that wasn't particularly welcoming, Absolutely. even though they were invited. Yeah. And and I just thought I could do better than that. I could, I could, I could make them proud. And um, I think they might be proud. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know, think of, they are very of, proud. Of, of, yeah, of they're very proud. But, it, but it is down to them, you know, it's down to them. It's an extension of, of their, of their input and their hard work. And, and, it hasn't been, you know, the thing about it is, is that you can, it's always great to, to claim, you know, credit for all of it, but I don't, you know what I mean? There was, a, there was a lot of people involved. Yeah, well, there's a lot of, in your life's journey, that's input. Yeah, absolutely. And it's whether you're big enough to see it, because a lot of people think I've done it all on my own. Absolutely. When in actual fact, well, along the way, this one did that and you didn't realize what it was going to do for you in the future. And Abs- absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. And people like that, like Mr. Leeds, yeah. the teacher, you know, who I just, who I always remember. He used to, he used to come and see shows when I was at the Barbican. And he's passed now, you said? I don't know. You don't know, last contact. And he used to That's just, yeah, and he used to just leave his, his he used to just leave a note. To say that he'd been. Yeah, he'd just go, Beautiful. I was in. He really believed Loved in you. Loved the performance. Well done, Ray. And they used to just leave a note. And I used to go, 
That's Mr. Leeds. <laughs> That's my Where teacher. Is he? He'd never hang around and go, fancy, he'd just, he'd be gone. And I'd go, wow. Yeah. But if it wasn't for someone like him to have Lots of people seen have something, the then, you know, uh, most probably, it, you know, and... And lots of people have gone by, you know, uh, and, and, and have passed on the way. But, um, you know, you just got to keep swimming, I suppose. Well, Ray, thank you so much for joining me. It's been it's a pleasure. It's great to see the man behind the public persona. Because <laughs> this is the real person, you know. This is Absolutely. what we want to see. Absolutely. So thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's a pleasure. Man. Great to see you. Yeah, you too. Thank you for joining us. And if there's anything in particular that resonates with you, please leave it in the comments. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and see you next time. We're done. We're done. We're done. No, I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>